Hi, I'm Jason Webb, Director of Industry Affairs at Potter Electric. Today's webinar is on protecting the devices that protect sprinkler systems. There's many different devices, we're going to get into some of those here in a few minutes, that, that help protect or monitor or supervise a dry or pre-action or wet pipe sprinkler system. And each of those devices has their own listing requirements. They have their own inspection, testing, and maintenance requirements. And often those requirements come from, from different standards. So that's going to be kind of today's topic is, is an overview of those, those common devices along with their uh, inspection, testing, and maintenance requirements, and some of the coordination that has to take place between standards and so on. Now, this is not a, uh, you know, a how-to course in terms of how to perform the actual test or maintenance in many cases. Um, you know, that requires a lab and, and hands-on in, in most, uh, for most of these devices. But what we will do is, is discuss it from a code perspective and, and a coordination perspective. So we're going to start with wet pipe systems and the, the types of devices that are often found on, on these, these very common wet pipe sprinkler systems. There's, there's several devices, as you'll see, that uh, monitor and supervise, whether it's the valve or pressures or, or uh, flow on these systems. And, and each of them have their own separate inspection, testing, and maintenance requirements. But what you'll also see as we go through the different types of systems is that many of these devices are, are common across uh, multiple systems. So some of the different types of, of electro electronic devices that we're going to address today are uh, things like a pressure activated water flow switch. So in this case, it's a pressure switch with a built-in retard that uh, you know, allows the pressure to fluctuate throughout the, the, the day of a normal wet pipe system without activating the alarm. You also have pressure switch uh, based water flow switches that don't have a built in retard. So in this case, they would be sitting on top of a retard chamber uh, of a wet pipe system that that chamber absorbs those fluctuations throughout the day. Now, anytime you have a valve on uh, or that controls flow or you know, pressure to these pressure switches, remember we have to have a supervisory switch or that valve has to be somehow supervised. The you NFPA know, 72 requires that in order to prevent us from being able to you know, inadvertently leave that valve shut and not or and render that pressure switch inoperable. Valve supervisory switches, we'll get into in a couple of slides and talk about the importance of those, but there's different types and styles of, of control valve supervisory switches, some of them each with their own inspection, testing, and maintenance requirements. Of course, vein type flow switches that exist on wet pipe systems. Uh, these can be installed in several different configurations, whether it's vertically on a, on a, uh, you know, a vertical riser, uh, horizontally on a floor control valve assembly or, or really anywhere that we want to uh, watch for water flow. But vein type flow switches have their own uh, special requirements. We'll get into some of those. And then a different type of control valve supervisory switch. But any valve controlling water supply has to have some kind of control valve supervisory switch. So there's lots of different uh, different methods for, for supervising those valves, but they all uh, essentially operate in the, same, in the same manner. On a dry pipe system, there's of course some of the similar type switches, but, but there's also some differences. So first of all, we have a, a, another type of pressure switch on a dry pipe system. This would be the pressure above the dry pipe valve that supervises the air pressure on the the dry pipe system, typically a, a PS40 or a, a 40 pound pressure switch that that operates at a higher uh, at a higher level than the PS10, that, which operates from 
or, or tells us about that there's water flow occurring in the dry pipe system. Room temperature switches that, that obviously monitor room temperature, that's critical in a dry pipe uh, valve enclosure. The pressure switch for water flow that we just talked about. That valve type or that ball valve supervisory switch that we mentioned in the earlier slide that's important again to prevent um, that ball valve from being inadvertently left closed thereby uh, eliminating the value of the pressure type flow switch on the on that side of the dry pipe valve more control valve supervisory switches just like we saw on the on the wet pipe system and again they can be in several different configurations one uh, kind of an outlier uh, not too commonly used but a plug type valve supervisory switch these are our specialty devices that are used in certain circumstances where there's just no other way to uh, supervise a uh, a valve control valve and those have their own set of inspection testing and maintenance requirements but just just be aware that beyond some of the typical components that we're going to talk about today there are some specialty devices and most of those uh, maintenance requirements come from the manufacturer's instructions of course pre-action systems have their own special set of devices we won't cover each of these today a lot of these uh, are, are typically uh, fire alarm components, but for today's presentation, you know, we're going to continue to address the high and low air supervision, much like on the air side of the dry pipe valve. The pressure type flow switch, again, very similar to that, or it's the same switch that's used on a dry pipe system and, and operates in much the same way ball valve supervision again of course if we have a ball valve in line before the pressure type flow switch we need to supervise that valve to keep it from being inadvertently left shut but then we've got some of these uh, the fire alarm devices that i mentioned heat detectors smoke detectors alarm bells or strobes that are tied to the activation of the pre-action system manual activation and manual uh, releasing or disable switches and then of course control valve supervision again any valve that's controls water supply to any of these systems has to has a half a uh, that valve has to be supervised so quickly as we get into some of these it's important to understand the differences between uh, these terms we're going to use. So these terms are all defined in NFPA 25 in Chapter 3. The term inspection is defined as a visual examination. So in other words, we, we're just looking at the device. We're not operating it. We're not you know, conducting any tests or, or manipulating it in any way. We're just simply looking at it. It's a visual examination of a system or portion thereof to verify that it appears to be in operating condition and it's free of physical damage. That's that's the the limits of the definition of an inspection in NFPA 25. NFPA 25 also defines the term testing. So now we're into a procedure or we're, we're doing something. So this is a procedure used to determine the operational status of some of these components. It lists several um, examples in the definition but but the main difference between a test and an inspection is that now we're operating the device we're doing something to ensure that it's working properly and you'll notice that there's an asterisk besides 3347 what that asterisk tells us is that there's some annex language that goes into uh, some explanatory information about the term testing and Primarily what, what that annex is telling us is that a test in and of itself is valuable, but it, it becomes even more valuable when we compare the data from this test to that of a previous test. So in other words, if you think about, uh, for example, a fire pump test, if you do the annual flow test uh, this year, it tells you uh, certain data points, but 
the value in that test comes from comparing that test to previous tests. That gives you an indication of a, of a problem more so than just the, 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 the data that you collect during that particular test. The last definition, of course, is maintenance in the Inspection, Testing, and Maintenance Standard. In NFPA 25, maintenance is simply defined as, as work performed to keep the equipment operable. So this would be typically things that we would do on a seasonal basis or, uh, for example, in, in the photograph there, draining the moisture out of the low point drains or the auxiliary drains to keep them from freezing. But uh, there's, there's lots of other maintenance, of course, in NFPA 25 and in NFPA 72, but it, it's simply work performed to keep the equipment operable. It's, it's just often it's triggered by the problems that we find during inspections or tests. So most of these devices that we're going to address in the next few minutes are covered uh, or addressed in both NFPA 25 and in NFPA 72. The terms, however, inspection and testing are not defined by NFPA 72. So for us to, uh, there's, an, there's an assumption, of course, and then, and then that, that they match. And then, of course, we follow NFPA's guidance that if the term is not defined, uh, we follow the definition in Webster's Collegiate Dictionary 11th edition. And those terms also are, are similar to those that are defined. But remember the definitions out of 25 as we go through these, because they're not defined specifically in, in FPA 72. So probably the most common device that we see monitoring or supervising a sprinkler system is a, a typical vein type flow switch. So we will address a few points about these these standard vein type flow switches will will address their listing requirements will address the typical inspection testing and maintenance that that occurs with a vein type flow switch we'll talk about the need to coordinate the standards the vein type flow switch is one of those that is uh, the coordination is critical on and we'll explain that in, in a few minutes and then we'll also talk about of course the common issues that we find with inspection, testing, and maintenance of a vein type flow switch. Now we'll do we'll do this for each of those uh, the, the categories of devices as we go through here. We won't get into quite as much detail with some of the others, but uh, this is the typical flow for uh, vein type flow switches, pressure switches, tamper switches, and then we'll look at a couple other uh, kind of type devices that supervise or monitor sprinkler systems as we uh, wrap up. So let's talk a little bit about the listing requirements for a vein type flow switch because it's, it's important to understand uh, the how these devices uh, are, must operate in order for them to meet the UL listing, the UL346 listing for, for their, their uh, water flow indicators. So What's important to remember is that these devices have to operate at not less than four gallons per minute, but at least 10 gallons per minute. So the reason that that number is important is that's not a lot of flow inside of a pipe. A lot of, uh, a lot of people think that, the, that when water flows in a, in a wet pipe system, that that, that, that paddle or that vein that's, that is inside the pipe, gets somehow you know really slammed up against the side the wall of the inside of the pipe and that's really not the case when the paddle moves uh, in in a typical uh, flow situation mimicking that flow from the single smallest orifice sprinkler that the codes tell us we have to do to to comply that's that's not much movement with the paddle and that that four to 10 gallons per minute really isn't a lot of, of movement inside of a pipe, especially when you're talking about, you know, a large size, you know, a six, eight inch riser, that there's just not a lot of movement in there. So these are fairly sensitive uh, devices by, by definition. Now they also have to uh, alarm or go or, or signal flow within 90 seconds. 
and that's just simply a feature of the retard that we talked about earlier the uh, when the switch moves of course it moves throughout the day with water fluctuations in a typical uh, water system but that retard allows some uh, movement without having to uh, without having constantly going to alarm but what the listing standard says is that that device does have to alarm within 90 seconds of that flow so NFPA 25 says we have to perform a quarterly inspection and remember an inspection is simply looking at the device what are we looking for well we're looking for physical damage this is a photograph that uh, I pulled off of a social media site nothing uh, uh, nothing to see here right I mean that's that's a uh, that's quite a jolt that that flow switch apparently took and that's the kind of things besides other physical damage from a you know somebody backing a forklift into it or, or whatever uh, that we're looking for during an inspection remember we're not performing any kind of functionality test during an inspection we're just simply looking at the device to see that it's free of physical damage so the next phase of the process is testing and, and a test is required semi-annually of a vein type flow switch and NFPA 25 says that that has to be conducted by opening the inspector's test connection. Now there's been some recent changes in NFPA 25 we'll talk about next that um, address some automated testing devices that are now on the market but a typical test of a typical vein type flow switch is semi-annually by opening the inspector's test connection to flow water past the device and, and create that flow from the single smallest orifice that four to ten gallons per minute that we talked about earlier so the new language that's in the 2020 edition of an fpa 25 permits the use of uh, auto tested or automated testing flow switches there are some rules that the, the the device itself has to comply with in order to to meet the requirements of NFPA 25 it has to have an integral automated test feature it has to be able to verify the presence of water and, and verify that it the device itself functions but when those requirements are met there is a per, uh, allowance now to use an auto testing flow switch device without flowing water why are we concerned about flowing water or adding new water to a, a wet pipe sprinkler system well the reason is is simply corrosion what what we want to do is reduce the amount of freshly oxygenated water that enters that wet pipe sprinkler system we know from the fm global reports that the the corrosion that takes place inside of a sprinkler system is most often caused by generalized or oxygen corrosion and that's in a wet pipe sprinkler system that oxygen is reintroduced over and over again every time we open that inspector's test and, and bring new fresh water into the system so if we can test the flow switch without having to do that um, introduce that new oxygen into the system we can reduce the amount of corrosion in the system going forward so vein type flow switches are uh, addressed both in NFPA 25 and NFPA 72 and in this case in the case of a vein type flow switch the actual inspection and test methods and the frequencies align so uh, in under the current standards everything aligns it's the same the same frequency and the same methods whether you're testing the device under NFPA 72 or under NFPA 25 the difference however is that NFPA 25 had no pass fail criteria for a successful test or for a test of a vein type flow switch until the 2020 edition NFPA 72 contains some pass fail criteria but it's not listed in chapter 14 in the uh, in the inspection testing and maintenance chapter but but beginning with the 2020 the new edition of NFPA 25 there is now criteria established for what a successful test of a flow switch looks like 
The new 2020 edition says that a water flow alarm device has to initiate an audible alarm within five minutes. Of course, that five minutes comes from NFPA 13. And it has to activate the initiating device. So the switch has to activate within 90 seconds, going back to that listing requirement that we talked about earlier. So that pass fail criteria now is contained in NFPA 25. But prior to the 2020 edition, all NFPA 25 said was you had to test the flow switch. It didn't give you that pass fail criteria. So what's the biggest issue with the vein type flow switch? Well, it's if you can see on that screen, the, the issue is manual uh, devices, whatever they are, being used to prevent the movement of the paddle. So whether it's a screwdriver, which seems to be the most common, commonly used item to wedge a flow switch into position, uh, but there's lots of others. I, I don't want to get into too many or, or folks will be uh, taking notes on how to wedge a flow switch into position, but this is the most common uh, problem found with a vein type flow switch is that they're often found with some sort of mechanical device uh, wedging them shut. Somebody was doing some uh, maintenance on the system, filling it or what have you, and, and didn't want to set the fire alarm off, so they wedged it, uh, wedged it into position. And those get left there very frequently. There are options to, to avoid that. Uh, Potter offers a, a flow switch bypass switch that connects, the, that goes in line between the flow switch and the fire alarm panel that simply disconnects that signal as it's being sent. It permits filling and maintenance without activating the fire alarm, but it also gives you an indication through the LED light that it is activated. So when the switch, this flow switch bypass switch is in the bypass position, the fire alarm panel goes into trouble. So it's something that can't be forgotten about. And then the, the red LED illuminates to tell you when the paddle is in that flow position. So you do have a, a way to test the switch without activating the fire alarm system during this uh, maintenance and, and filling operations. So valve supervisory switches, there's lots of different varieties and, and different applications. Uh, we, we talked about some of those a little bit earlier. There's several different listing requirements uh, that are part of that UL uh, standard that we mentioned earlier. These are a, a device similar to a flow switch in that they're, they're uh, when the when the trip stem moves into a position to to activate the switch, that's what sends the signal you know to the alarm panel. There's some typical inspection, testing, and maintenance issues that we'll address quickly as we go through here. But these devices, remember, uh, are, are critical for the operation of a system in that we know through NFPA. Uh, and National Fire Incident Reporting System fire loss data that most of the time when a sprinkler system fails to operate in a fire, it's because the valve was shut before the, the, the fire. And that's the purpose. That's why the codes require all valves controlling the uh, flow, water flow to a sprinkler system to be electronically supervised. And these are the types of devices that, that we're referring to. There is a little bit of coordination of standards that takes place with these as well. And we'll talk about those here in a minute. So the types of valve supervisory switches, there's, there's many uh, depending on the type of valve, whether it's a, a, a OSY, an outside screw and yoke valve, if it's a butterfly type valve, there's different types of switches. All, any kind of valve, and I showed you that plug type switch that can be used even in specialty uh, circumstances, but any valve on a sprinkler system is, is suitable for supervision. There's no you know, excuse for not supervising the control valve on any sprinkler system. In FPA 25 and 72 align in terms of uh, what constitutes a pass fail of a flow switch, or I'm sorry, of a uh, supervisory switch uh, test. 
It's a signal sent within one fifth or uh, or two revolutions of the wheel. Uh, it must verify that the signal doesn't restore at any position except fully open. And what that means is uh, you must run the stem all the way in and out to make sure that 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 trip stem doesn't fall into a groove or into the threaded grooves and restore itself at any position other than fully open. The common issues with these are, are often um, misalignment or misapplication. They, they don't get installed properly or they get bumped and, and uh, banged into. And again, that's part of that inspection and testing process that we've talked so much about. With pressure switches, much like all these other switches, many different types and applications. Uh, there's there's typical inspection, testing, and maintenance that that go with a flow with a pressure switch. Uh, we talked about the applications earlier, whether it be as a supervisory switch on the air side of a dry system, or as an alarm, water flow alarm switch on that side of the system, but the, the switches themselves uh, operate in a very similar manner, detecting a change in pressure. So because of that, testing typically involves the dropping of the pressure. If you've seen this device before, it's, it's a BVL or a ball valve switch with an orifice that allows you to shut the valve and bleed the pressure off slowly, the, uh, testing the switch without having to trip the, the system. NFPA 72 is where the off-normal criteria is established for the, the amount of pressure, depending on whether it's supervisory or uh, water flow. And that uh, off-normal criteria can vary based on, or not the drop, but, but the pressure settings for those uh, dry systems can vary based on the, the manufacturer of the dry pipe valve. So it's, it's important to understand that there's different pressures and different uh, testing that must take place based on the type of dry pipe valve. If it's a low pressure valve, it's a, maybe a little more sensitive to some of those pressure changes. And we want to make sure we're avoiding the activation of the system during testing of the pressure switch. NFPA 25 has a, what's called a component action table uh, that tells us whenever we make a change to the system, what do we have to do to restore that system to service. Alarm or supervisory devices are lumped together in that table, uh, table 13.8.1 in NFPA 25, the 2014 edition. It says that if we adjust, repair, or replace any of these devices, they have to be tested per NFPA 13 and or NFPA 72. So again, most of the time these tests, these acceptance tests line up, but we need to make sure that we understand that if we replace or even adjust one of these switches, there's a complete acceptance test that has to take place per NFPA 25, and then it refers us to NFPA 13 or 72 for those uh, acceptance test procedures. So lastly, uh, some maybe less common devices, they're becoming more and more common. And in the case of, of some types of systems, they're on almost every uh, dry system, for example, when we talk about air maintenance devices. But uh, there's a few other devices that are common to the uh, uh, taking care of sprinkler systems. And that, those are air vents, uh, air maintenance devices, and low temperature alarms. Air vents, which are required beginning with the 2016 edition of NFPA 13, there's no specific inspection, testing, and maintenance for air vents themselves. They're, they're basically maintenance-free devices. But you do need to remember that there are screens uh, in those filter screens to prevent uh, debris from entering the, the valve itself, the air valve, and, and during, you know, causing problems. So those screens do need to be inspected at five years. That's part of a typical five-year internal inspection requirement out of NFPA 25. Air maintenance devices are covered in NFPA 25 in Chapter 13, and they're required to be tested annually during the trip test, the full flow or, or the partial trip test of the dry pipe valve in accordance 
with manufacturer's instructions is the requirement out of NFPA 25. And those are typically just uh, verify the pressure on the on the gauge that it matches the pressure in the system and you know some basic things like that that the valves are in the position they're supposed to be etc and then of course low temperature alarms we touched on earlier the important nature of verifying or the temperature in a dry pipe valve enclosure is above freezing and those low temperature alarms are required to be tested at the beginning of the heating system it's our season that's what an fpa 25 requires so that does it for this uh, webinar on taking care of the devices or that protect sprinkler systems again lots of detail there in within each of these individual devices all those requirements can be found in manufacturers data sheets in nfpa 25 and nfpa 72 um, lots of different um, tasks and frequencies that take place but it's important that we take care of these devices because they are the ones that are monitoring or supervising these systems and in some cases uh, helping them activate in terms of uh, a pre-action system and so forth so appreciate your time if you have any questions about this or any other potter products please feel free to to give me or anyone at potter a a, a shout you can reach me at jasonw at pottersignal.com anytime thank you